This is KBOO Portland, community radio for the Pacific Northwest. Right now, the following program may contain language and situations not suitable for young audiences. But of course, it's the bedtime radio show for grown-ups, Gremlin Time. You are entering a zone of sound and imagery. A landscape of frequency. A vocabulary of modulation. There is the signpost up ahead. Please adjust your chronometers. This is Gremlin Time. Good evening and welcome to Gremlin Time. Tonight's story was inspired by Mary Shelley's novel Frankenstein and first appeared in the early years of World War II in a 1940 issue of Unknown Magazine. It is a story of unthinking evil. And it is by the author of More Than Human and Venus X, science fiction writer Theodore Sturgeon. So listen now to It by Theodore Sturgeon. It walked in the woods. It was never born. It existed. Under the pine needles, the fires burned deep and smokeless in the mold. In heat and in darkness and decay, there is growth. There is life and there is growth. It grew, but it was not alive. It walked unbreathing through the woods and thought and saw and was hideous and strong and it was not born and it did not live. It grew and moved about without living. It crawled out of the darkness and the hot damp mold into the cool of a morning. It was huge. It was lumped and crusted with its own hateful substances, and pieces of it dropped off as it went its way, dropped off and lay, writhing and still, and sank putrescent into the forest loam. It had no mercy, no laughter, no beauty. It had strength and great intelligence, and perhaps it could not be destroyed. It crawled out of its mound in the wood and lay pulsing in the sunlight for a long moment. Patches of it shone wetly in the golden glow. Parts of it were nibbled and flaked. And whose dead bones had given it the form of a man? It scrambled painfully with its half-formed hands, beating the ground in the bowl of a tree. It rolled and lifted itself up on its crumbling elbows, and it tore up a great handful of herbs and spread them against its chest. And it paused and gazed at the gray, green juices with intelligent calm. It wavered to its feet and seized a young sapling and destroyed it, folding the slender trunk back on itself again and again, watching attentively the useless fibered splinters. And it snatched up a squealing, fear-frozen field creature, crushing it slowly, letting blood and pulpy flesh and fur ooze from between its fingers, run down, and rot on the forearms began searching. Kimbo drifted through the tall grasses like a puff of dust. His bushy tail curled tightly over his back and his long jaws agape. He ran with an easy lope, loving his freedom and the power of his flanks and furry shoulders. His tongue lolled listlessly over his lips. His lips were black and serrated, and each tiny pointed liplet swayed with his doggy gallop. Kimbo was all dog, all healthy animal. He leaped high over a boulder and landed with a startling yelp as a long-eared connie shot from its hiding place under the rock. Kimbo hurled after it, grabbing with each great thrust of his legs. The rabbit bounced just ahead of him keeping its distance, its ears flapping on its curving back and its little legs nibbling away at a distance hungrily. 
it stopped. And Kimbo pounced, and the rabbit shot away at a tangent and popped into a hollow log. Kimbo yelped again and rushed, sniffling at the log, and on his failure, curvetted at once around the stump and ran on into the forest. The thing that watched from the wood raised its crusted arms and waited for Kimbo. Kimbo sensed it there, standing dead still by the path. To him it was a bulk which smelled of carrion not fit to roll in, and he snuffled disdainfully and ran to pass it. The thing let him come abreast and dropped a heavy, twisted fist on him. Kimbo saw it coming and curled up tight as he ran, and the hand clipped stunningly on his rump, sending him rolling and yipping down the slope. Kimbo straddled to his feet, shook his head, and shook his body with a deep growl, came back to the silent thing with green murder in his eyes. He walked stiffly, straight-legged, his tail as low as his lowered head, and a ruff of fury round his neck. The thing raised its arms again, waited. Kimbo slowed, and flipped himself through the air at the monster's throat. His jaws closed on it, his teeth clicking together through a mass of filth, and he fell, choking and snarling at its feet. The thing leaned down and struck twice, and after the dog's back was broken, it sat beside him and began to tear him apart. I'll be back in a, an hour or so, said Alton Drew, picking up his rifle from the corner behind the wood box. His brother laughed. <laughs> old Kimbo about runs your life, Alton. Uh, I know the old devil. When I whistle for him for half an hour and he don't show up, he's in a jam or he's treated something worth shooting at. That old son of a gun calls me by not answering. Corey Drew shoved a full glass of milk over to his nine-year-old daughter and smiled. You think as much of that hound dog of yours as I do of Babe here. Babe slid off her chair and ran to her uncle. Gonna catch the bad fella, Uncle Alton? Bad fella was Corey's invention. The one who lurked in corners, ready to pounce on little girls, who chased the chickens and played around mowing machines, and who dug caves in haystacks till they tipped over, and kept pet crawfish in tomorrow's milk cans, and rode workhorses to a lather in the night pasture. Get back here and keep away from Uncle Alton's gun. If you see the bad fella Alton, chase him back here. He has a date with Babe here for that stun of hers last night. The preceding evening, Babe had uh, kind-heartedly poured pepper on the cow's salt block. Don't you worry, kiddo. I'll bring you the bad fella's hide. If you don't get me first. Alton Drew walked up the path toward the wood, thinking about Babe. She was a phenomenon, a pampered farm child. Oh, well, she had to be. They'd both loved Clissia Drew, and she'd married Corey, and they had to love Clissia's child. Funny thing, love. Alton was a man's man and thought things out that way, and his reaction to love was a strong and frightened one. He knew what love was because he felt it still for his brother's wife and would feel it as long as he lived for being led him through his life, and yet he embarrassed himself by thinking of it. Loving a dog was an easy thing, because you and the old devil could love one another completely without talking about it. The smell of gun smoke and the smell of wet fur in the rain were perfume enough for Alton Drew, a grunt of satisfaction and the scream of something hunted and hit were poetry enough. They weren't like love for a human. That choked his throat so he could not say words he could not have thought of anyway. So Alton loved his dog Kimbo and his Winchester for all to see, and lent his love for his brother's women, Clissy and Babe, eat at him quietly and unmentioned. His quick eyes saw the fresh indentations of the soft earth behind the boulder, which showed where Kimbo had turned and leaped with a single surge chasing the rabbit. Nor in the tracks, he looked for the nearest place where a rabbit might hide and strolled over to the stump. Kimbo had been there, he saw, and 
had been there too late. Fool dog. You can't catch a Connie by chasing it. You want to cross him up some way. A little puzzled, Alton went back to the path. Kimbo! Never done this before. Kimbo! Oh, flea bus. There was something about this he didn't like. Kimbo! He cocked his 3240 and cradled it. At the county fair, someone had once said of Alton Drew that he could shoot at a handful of salt and pepper thrown in the air and hit only the pepper. Once he split a bullet on the blade of a knife and put two candles out, he had no need to fear anything that could be shot at. That's what he believed. Kimbo! The thing in the woods looked curiously down at what it had done to Kimbo and known the way Kimbo had before he died. It stood a minute storing away facts in its foul, unemotional mind. Blood was warm. The sunlight was warm. Things that moved and bore fur had a muscle to force the thick liquid through tiny tubes in their bodies. The liquid coagulated after time. The liquid on rooted green things was thinner, and a loss of a limb did not mean loss of life. Very interesting. But the thing, the mold with the mind, was not pleased. Neither was it displeased. Its accidental urge was a thirst for knowledge. And it was only interested. It was growing late, and the sun reddened and rested a while on the hilly horizon. The thing threw up its head suddenly, noticing the dusk. It threw its shapeless head from side to side. It was true. Things were dim and growing dimmer. Things were changing shape, taking on a new and darker color. What did the creatures it had crushed and torn apart seem? How did they see? The larger one, the one that had attacked him, had used two organs in its head. That must have been it. Because after the thing had torn off two of the dog's legs, it had stuck at the hairy muzzle, and the dog, seeing the blow coming, had dropped folds of skin over the organs, closing its eyes. Ergo, the dog saw with its eyes. But then after the dog was dead and its body still, repeated blows had had no effect on the eyes. They remained open, staring. The logical conclusion was, then, that a being ceased to live and breathe and move about lost the use of its eyes. It must be that to lose sight was, conversely, to die. Dead things did not walk about. They lay down and did not move. Therefore, the thing in the wood concluded that it must be dead. And so it lay down by the path, not far away from Kimbo's shattered body, lay down and believed itself dead. Alden Drew came up through the dust of the wood. He was frankly worried. Kimbo! And there was still no response. Oh, flea bus. I've never done this before. And shook his head. It was past milking time and Corey would need him. Kimbo! The cry echoed through the shadows and Alton flipped on the safety catch of his rifle and put the butt on the ground beside the path. Leaning on it, he took off his cap and scratched the back of his head, wondering... The rifle butt sank into what he thought was soft earth. He staggered and stepped into the chest of the thing that lay beside the path. His foot went up to the ankle in its yielding rottenness. Ugh. Something sure dead as hell there. He swabbed at his boot with a handful of leaves while the monster lay in the growing blackness, with the edges of the deep footprint in his chest sliding into it, filling it up. It lay there regarding him dimly out of its muddy eyes, thinking it was dead because of the darkness, watching the articulation of Alton Drew's joints, wondering at this new, uncautious creature. Uh. Alton cleaned the butt of his gun with more leaves and went on up the path, whistling anxiously for Kimbo. Mm Plissia Drew stood in the doorway of the milk shed, very lovely in red checkered gingham and a blue apron. Her hair was clean yellow, parted in the middle and stretched 
tauntly back to a heavy braided knot. Corey Alton? Corey responded gruffly from the barn where he was stripping off the Ashshire. The dwindling streams of milk plopped pleasantly into the froth of a full pail. I've called and called. Supper's cold and, and Babe won't eat until you come. What? Where's Alton? Ain't back yet. Not back. But Corey, he said he... Yeah. Yeah, I know. He said he'd be back for the milk and I heard him. Well, he ain't. Clisia came in and stood beside him as he sat by the next cow. And you have to... Oh, Corey, I'll help you finish up. Alton would be back if he could. Maybe he's just... Yeah, maybe he's treed a blue jay. Him and that damn dog. She was thinking of the spring when Kimbo had held 400 pounds of raging black bear at bay until Alton could put a bullet in its brain. Babe had found a bear cub and started to carry it home and had, can't hate a dog that saves your child. I got 26 head of cows to milk. I got pigs to feed, chickens to put to bed. I got to toss hay for the mare and turn the team out. I got wood to split and carry, so I got to go ahead with it. Every damn time that hound of his smells out a squirrel, I go without my supper. I'm getting sick of it. Oh, I'll help you. You'll do nothing of the kind. Get back to the house. You'll find enough work there. I'll be along when I can. Corey. No oh, shucks. I'm wrought up. Go on now. I had no call to speak that way to you. I'm sorry. All right. Go back to babe. I'll put a stop to this for good tonight. I've had enough. There's work here for four farmers, and all we got is me and that, that huntsman. Corey, you're not going to... I'll be back during soon. It's after nine. I don't reckon he strayed far. Hear him out first. He's got no excuse good enough this time. He might not time. be able to come back this time. Maybe he... Nothing can hurt my brother that a bullet will hit. I he just... take care of himself. He was never this late before. Now go on now. Make the kitty. All right. I knew you'd go. Oh, why did Alton have to pick this time of all times? If Corey quarreled with Alton now and drove him away, what with the drought and the creamery about to close and all, they just couldn't manage. Hiring a man was out of the question. Corey'd have to work himself to death, and he just wouldn't be able to make it. No one man could. She sighed and went into the house. Babe was in bed and Clissia heard Corey in the shed. Dog goes hunting field mice. I'll be damned. He has no call to use us, so Clissia. He broke his 12-gauge shotgun, looked through the barrel, slid two shells into the breech and a box of them into his pocket. The path up the slope to the wood was very dark when Corey went up it. The air was chill and quiet and a fetid odor of mold hung in it. Corey blew the taste of it through impatient nostrils, drew it in again with the next breath, and swore. Hound dog, hunting ten o'clock at night. Alton! Alton Drew! Echoes answered him, and he entered the wood. The huddled thing he passed in the dark heard him, and felt the vibrations of his footsteps and did not move because it thought it was dead. Corey strode on, looking around and ahead, not down since his feet knew the path. Alton? That you, Corey? Corey drew froze. A corner of the wood was thickly set and as dark as a burial vault. The voice he heard was choked, quiet, penetrating. Alton? I found Kimbo, Corey. Where the hell have you been? Called him, Corey. I whistled at him and the old devil didn't answer. I can say the same for you, you you louse. Why weren't you to milk it? Where are you? Are you caught in a trap? The hound never missed answering me before, you know. Alton, what the devil's the matter with you? What do I care if your mutt didn't answer? Where? That's because he ain't never died before. You what? Alton, you turned crazy? What's that you said? Kimbo's dead. Kim- oh. Corey was seeing that picture again in his mind. Babe sprawled unconscious in the freshet, and Kimbo raging and snapping against the monster bear, holding her back until Alton could get there. What happened, Alton? I aimed to find out. Someone tore him up. Tore him up? There ain't a bit of enough tacked together, Corey. Every damn joint in his body tore apart. Guts out of him. Good God. Bear, you reckon? No bear. No, nothing on four legs. He's all here. None of them's been at. Whoever done it just killed him and tore him up. God. Who could have... There was a long silence then. Come, come along home. There's no call for you to set up by him all night. All set. I am to be here at sunup. And I'm going to start tracking. And I'm going to keep tracking until I find the one that done this job on Kimbo. You're drunk or crazy, Alton? I ain't drunk. 
You can think what you like about the rest of it. I'm sticking here. We got a farm back yonder. Remember? I ain't gonna milk 26 head of cows again in the morning like I did just now, Alton. Somebody's got to. I can't be there. I guess you'll just have to, Corey. You dirty scum! You'll come back with me now or I'll know why. Don't you come no nearer, bud. I said stop where you are. You got your gun on me, Alton. That's right, bud. You ain't tromping up these tracks for me. I need them at sunup. A full minute passed and the only sound in the darkness was that of Corey's pained breathing. Finally... I got my gun too, Alton. Come home. You can't see to shoot me. We're even on that. We ain't. I know just where you stand, Corey. I've been here four hours. My gun scatters. My gun kills. At another word, Corey drew, turned on his heel, and stomped back to the farm. You're listening this evening to It, a short story by Theodore Sturgeon that first appeared in the pages of Unknown Magazine back in 1940. And now a quick musical break. Welcome back to Gremlin Time. Let's return now to our story, It, by Theodore Sturgeon. Black and liquescent, it lay in the darkness. Not alive, not understanding death, 
believing itself dead. Things that were alive saw and moved about. Things that were not alive could do neither. It rested its muddy gaze on the line of trees at the crest of the rise, and deep within it, its thoughts trickled wetly. It lay huddled, dividing its newfound facts, dissecting them as it had dissected live things when there was light, comparing, concluding, pigeonholing. The trees at the top of the slope could just be seen as their trunks were a fraction of a shade lighter than the dark sky behind them. At length, they too disappeared, and for a moment, sky and trees were a monotone. The thing knew it was dead now, and like many a being before it, it wondered how long it must stay like this. And then the sky beyond the trees grew a little lighter. It was a manifestly impossible occurrence, thought the thing, but it could see it. It must be so. Did the things live again? That was curious. What about this member of dead things? It would wait and see. The sun came hand over hand up a beam of light. A bird somewhere made a high, yawning peep. And as an owl killed a shrew, a skunk pounced on another, so that the night shift deaths and those of day could go on without cessation. Two flowers nodded arkly to each other, comparing their pretty clothes. A dragonfly nymph decided it was tired of looking serious and cracked its back open to crawl out and dry gazily. The first golden ray sheared down between the trees through the grasses passed over the mass and the shadowed bushes. I'm alive again, thought the thing that could not possibly live. I am alive. It stood up on its thick legs, up into the golden glow. In a little while, the wet flakes that had grown during the night dried in the sun. When it took its first steps, they cracked off, and a little shower of them fell away. It walked up the slope to find Kimbo, to see if he too were alive again. Babe let the sun come into her room by opening her eyes. Uncle Alton was gone. It was the first thing that ran through her head. Dad had come home last night and had shouted at Mother for an hour. Alton was plumb crazy. He turned a gun on his own brother. If Alton ever came ten feet into Corey's land, Corey would fill him so full of holes he'd look like a tumbleweed. Alton was lazy shiftless, selfish, and one or two other things of questionable taste but undoubted vividness. Babe knew her father. Uncle Alton would never be safe in this country. She bounced out of bed in the inevitable way of the very young and ran to the window. Corey was trudging down to the night pasture with two bridles over his arms to get the team. There were kitchen noises from downstairs. Babe dunked her head in the wash bowl and shook off the water like a terrier before she toweled. Trail and clean shirt and dungaree, she went to the head of the stairs, slid into the shirt, and began her morning ritual with the trousers. One step down was a step through the right leg, one more, and she was into the left. And bouncing step by step on both feet, buttoning one button per step, she reached the bottom fully dressed and ran into the kitchen. Didn't Uncle Alton come back at all, Mom? Morning, babe, no dear. Clarissa was too quiet, smiling too much. Babe thought shrewdly, wasn't happy. Where'd he go, Mom? We don't know, Babe. Sit down and eat your breakfast. What's a Miss Begotten, Mom? Her mother nearly dropped the dish she was drawing. Babe, you must never say that again. Oh, well, why is Uncle Alton then? Why is he what? Babe's mouth muscled around an outside spoonful of oatmeal. All right, Mom. Well, why? I told Corey not to shout last night. Well, whatever it means, he isn't. Did he go hunting again? He went to look for Kimbo, darling. Kimbo? Oh, Mommy, is Kimbo gone too? Didn't he come back either? No, dear. Oh, please, babe, stop asking questions. All right. Where do you think they went? Into the North Woods. Be quiet. 
Babe gulped away at her breakfast. An idea struck her, and as she thought of it, she ate slower and slower and cast more and more glances at her mother from under the lashes of her tilted eyes. It'd be awful if Daddy did anything to Uncle Alton. Somebody ought to warn him. Babe was halfway to the woods when Alton's 3240 sent echoes giggling up and down the valley. Corey was in the South 30, riding a cultivator and cussing a Whoa. team of greys when he heard the gun. One, two, three, four. He threw out the cultivator points and saw someone blasted away at him. Steered the team into the shade of the three oaks. Had a chance to take aim and give him another. Careful, my God. Hobbled the gelding with the swift hosses of a spare strap and headed for the woods. Ultimate killer. God. He murmured and doubled back to the house for his gun. Clissia was standing just outside the door. Get shells! He snapped and flung into the house. Clissia followed him. He was strapping his hunting knife on before she could get a box of it off the shelf. Corey! You hear that gun? Alton's off his nut. He don't waste lead. He shot at someone just then, and he wasn't fixing to shoot partridges when I saw him last. He was out to get a man. Give me my gun. Corey, babe is... You keep her here. Oh, God, this is a hell of a mess. I can't stand much more. Corey ran to the door. Clissia caught his arm. Corey, I'm trying to tell you, babe isn't here. I've called, and she isn't here. What? Babe? Where'd you last see her? Breakfast. She say where she was going? No. She asked a lot of questions about Alton and where he'd gone. Did you say? Clissia's eyes widened and she nodded, biting the back of her hand. Yes. You shouldn't have done that, Clissa. Ran toward the woods. Clissia looked after him and in that moment, she could have killed herself. Corey ran with his head up, straining with his legs and lungs and eyes at the long path. He puffed up the slope to the woods, agonized for breath after the 45 minutes heavy going. Couldn't even notice the damp smell of mold in the air. He caught a movement in a thicket to his right and dropped, struggling to keep his breath. He crept forward until he could see clearly. There was something in there, all right. Something black, keeping still. Corey relaxed his legs and torso completely to make it easier for his heart to pump some strength back into them, and slowly raised the 12 gauge until it bore on the thing hidden in the thicket. Come out. Nothing happened. Come out, or by God, I'll shoot. There was a long moment of silence, and his fingers tightened on the trigger. You asked for it. And as he fired, the thing leaped sideways into the open, screaming. Oh. It was a thin little man dressed in sepulchral black, oh, bearing the rosiest little baby face Corey had ever seen. You shot me! The face was twisted with fright and pain. Oh. The little man scrambled to his feet don't shoot again. and hopped oh, up goodness. and down, saying don't, over don't and over. Don't shoot again! Oh, my hand! He stopped after a bit when Corey had climbed to you his feet me. and regarded the farmer out of a sad, china-blue eyes. Oh, my goodness! Now, who the hell are you? The man immediately became hysterical, mouthing it. such a flood a of broken man. sentences horrible. that Corey stepped back a pace and, and half raised his horrible. gun in self-defense. Oh, don't, don't shoot again! The dead man! I, I lost my papers! I didn't do it! Corey it tried horrible. twice to ask horrible. him a question, and then he stepped over I, and knocked the man do down. Shut up! He lay on the ground, writhing and moaning I, I and blubbering and putting his bloody it. hand to his mouth. I was walking along and I heard a gun and I heard someone, some swearing and an awful scream. And I went over there and peeped and I saw the dead man and I ran away and you came and I hid and, and you shot me and... Now, you say there's a dead man up there. The man nodded and began crying in earnest. Corey helped him up. Follow this path back to my farmhouse. Tell my wife to fix up your hand. Don't tell her anything else. And wait there till I come. You hear? Yes. Thank you. Oh, oh, thank you. Go on now. Before he oh, gave him a gentle you. shove in the right direction and went along in cold fear, up the path to the spot where he had found Alton the night before. He found him here now, too, and Kimbo. Kimbo and Alton had spent several years together in the deepest friendship. They had hunted and fought and slept together, and the lives they owed each other were finished now. They were dead together. It was terrible that they died the same way. Corey Drew was a strong man, but he gasped and fainted dead away when he saw what the thing of the mold had done to his brother and his brother's dog. 
He did not see the great moist horror that clumped along behind him, though his nostrils crinkled a little with its foulness. The monster had three little holes close together on its chest, and one little hole in the middle of its slimy forehead. It had three close-set pits in its back and one on the back of its head. These marks were where Alton's bullets had struck and passed through. Half of the monster's shapeless face was slouched away, and there was a deep indentation on its shoulder. This was what Alton Drew's gun butt had done after he clubbed it and struck at the thing that would not lie down when he put his four bullets through it. When these things happened, the monster was not hurt or angry. It only wondered why Alton Drew acted that way. Now it followed the little man without hurrying at all, matching its stride step by step and dropping little particles of muck behind it. The little man went on out of the wood and stood with his back against the big tree at the forest edge and he thought, enough had happened to him here. What good would it do to stay and face a horrible murder in quest just to continue this silly, vague quest? There was supposed to be the ruin of an old, old hunting lodge deep in this wood somewhere, and perhaps it would hold the evidence he wanted. But it was a vague rumor, vague enough to be forgotten without regret. It would be the height of foolishness to stay for all the hicktown red tape that would follow that ghastly affair back in the wood. Ergo, it would be ridiculous to follow that farmer's advice to go to his house and wait for him. I, I don't need the money. I'll, I, I'll do without the money. He would go back to town, heading across country to the distant highway. The monster gazed vacantly at the disappearing figure of the little man and, finding him no longer interesting, turned back into the woods. Bay broke into a trot at the sound of the shots. It was important to warn Uncle Alton about what her father had said, but it was more interesting to find out what he had bagged. Oh, he'd bagged it all right. Uncle Alton never fired without killing. This was about the first time she had ever heard him blast away like that. Must be a bear, she thought, excitedly, tripping over a root, sprawling, rolling to her feet again without noticing the tumble. She'd love to have another bear skin in her room. Where would she put it? Maybe they could line it and she could have it for a blanket. Uncle Alton could sit on it to and read to her in the evening. Oh, no. No, not with this trouble between him and Dad. Oh, if she could only do something. She tried to run faster, worried and anticipating, but she was out of breath and went more slowly instead. At the top of the rise by the edge of the woods, she stopped and looked back. Far down in the valley lay the South 30. She scanned it carefully, looking for her father. The new furrows and the old were sharply defined, and her keen eyes saw immediately that Corey had left the line with the cultivator and had angled the team over to the shade tree without finishing his row. That wasn't like him. She could see the team now, and Corey's pale blue denim was not in sight. A little nearer was the house, and as her gaze fell on it, she moved out of the cleared pathway. Her father was coming. She had seen a shotgun and he was running. He could really cover ground when he wanted to. He must be chasing her, she thought immediately. He'd guessed that she'd run toward the sound of the shots and he was going to follow her tracks to Uncle Alton and shoot him. She knew that he was as good a woodsman as Alton. He would most certainly see her tracks. Well, she'd fix him. She ran along the edge of the wood, being careful to dig her heels deeply into the loam. A hundred yards of this, and she angled into the forest and ran until she reached a particularly thick grove of trees, shimmying up like a squirrel. She squirmed from one close-set tree to another until she could go no farther back toward the path, then dropped lightly to the ground and crept on her way, now stepping very gently. It would take him an hour to beat around for her trail, she thought proudly, and by that time she could easily get to Uncle Alton. She giggled to herself as she thought of the way she had fooled her father, and the little sound of laughter drove out of her the sound of Alton's hoarse, dying scream. She reached and crossed the path and slid through the brush beside it. The shots came from up around here she somewhere. 
She stopped and listened several times and then suddenly heard something coming towards her, fast. She ducked under cover, terrified, and a little baby-faced man in black, his blue eyes wide with horror, crashed blindly past her. The leather case he carried catching on the branches. It spun a moment and then fell right in front of her. The man never missed it. Babe lay there for a long moment and then picked up the case and faded into the woods. Things were happening too fast for her. She wanted Uncle Olton, but she dared not call. She stopped again and strained her ears. Back towards the edge of the woods, she heard her father's voice and another's, probably the man who had dropped the briefcase. She dared not go over there. Filled with enjoyable terror, she thought, hard, then snapped her fingers in triumph. She and Alton had played Injun many times here. They had a whole repertoire of secret signals. She had practiced bird calls until she knew them better than the birds themselves. What would it be? Ah, Blue Jay. She threw back her head and by some youthful alchemy produced a nerve-shattering screech that would have done justice to any jay that ever flew. She repeated it and then twice more. The response was immediate. The call of a blue jay. Four times, space two and two. Babe nodded to herself happily. That was the signal that they were to meet immediately at the place. The place was a hideout that he had discovered and shared with her, and not another soul knew of it. An angle of rock beside a stream, not very far away. It wasn't exactly a cave, but almost. Enough so to be entrancing. Babe trotted happily away toward the brook. She had just known that Uncle Alton would remember the call of the blue jay and what it meant. In the tree that arched over Alton's shattered body perched a large jaybird, preening itself and shining in the sun, quite unconscious of the presence of death. Hardly noticing the babe's realistic cry, it screeched again four times, two, and two. It took Corey more than a moment to recover himself from what he had seen turned away from it and leaned weakly against a pine, panting. That was Alton lying there in parts. God! 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 Gradually his strength returned, and he forced himself to turn again. Stepping carefully, he bent and picked up the thirty-two forty. Its barrel was bright and clean, but the button stock was smeared with some kind of stinking rottenness. I've already seen this stuff before. Somewhere, no matter. He cleaned it off absently, throwing the befouled bandana away afterward. Corey searched shrinkingly until he found Alton's box of shells. The box was wet and sticky. That made it better somehow. A bullet wet with Alton's blood was the right thing to use. He went away a short distance, circled around until he found heavy footprints, and came back. I'm a tracking for you, bud, he whispered thickly and began. Through the brush, he followed its wavering spore, amazed at the amount of filthy mold about, gradually associating it with the thing that had killed his brother. Babe stopped and turned when he, she heard her father's voice, faint with distance, piercing. Gee, listen at him holler. Sounds mad. She sent a jaybird's call disrespectfully back to him and hurried to the place. It consisted of a mammoth boulder beside the brook. Some upheaval in the glacial age had cleft it, cutting out a huge V-shaped chunk. The widest part of the cleft was at the water's edge, and the narrowest was hidden by bushes. It made a little ceilingless room, rough and uneven and full of potholes and cavelets inside and, and yet with quite a level floor. The open end was at the water's edge. They parted the bushes and peered down the cleft. Uncle Alton! There was no answer. Oh, well, he'll be along. She scrambled in and slid down to the floor. She loved it here. It was shaded and cool, and the chattering little stream filled it with shifting golden lights and laughing gurgles. 
She called again on principle and then perched on an outcropping to wait. It was only then that she realized she still carried the little man's briefcase. She turned it over a couple of times and then opened it. It was divided in the middle by a leather wall. On one side were a few papers and a large yellow envelope. And on the other, some sandwiches, a candy bar, and an apple. With the youngster's complacent acceptance of manna from heaven, Babe fell to. She saved one sandwich for Alton, mainly because she didn't like its highly spiced bologna. The rest made quite the feast. She was a little worried when Alton hadn't arrived. She got up and tried to skim some flat pebbles across the rolling brook. And she stood on her hands and she tried to think of a story to tell herself. And she tried just waiting. Finally, in desperation, she turned again to the briefcase and took out the papers, curled up by the rocky wall, and began to read them. It was something to do anyway. There was an old newspaper clipping that told about strange wills that people had left. An old lady had once left a lot of money to whoever would make the trip from the earth to the moon and back. Another had financed a home for cats whose masters and mistresses had died. But one item was blue penciled. It was. One of the strangest of wills still in force is that of Thaddeus M. Kirk, who died in 1920. It appears that he built an elaborate mausoleum with burial vaults for all the remains of his family. He collected and removed caskets from all over the country to fill the designated niches. Kirk was the last of his line. There were no relatives when he died. His will stated that the mausoleum was to be kept in repair permanently and that a certain sum was to be set aside as a reward for whoever could produce the body of his grandfather, Roger Kirk, whose niche is still empty. Anyone finding this body is eligible to receive a substantial fortune. Babe yawned vaguely over this. Boring. But kept on reading because there was nothing else to do. Next was a thick sheet of business correspondence bearing the letterhead of a firm of lawyers. See, what, is that? what does that say? Oh. The body of it ran... In regard to your query regarding the will of Thaddeus Kirk, we are authorized to state that his grandfather was a man of about five feet, five inches, whose left arm had been broken and who had a triangular silver plate set into his skull. There is no information as to the whereabouts of his death. He disappeared and was declared legally dead after the lapse of 14 years. The amount of the reward as stated in the will, plus accrued interest, now amounts to a fraction over $62,000. This will be paid to anyone who produces the remains, provided that said remains answer descriptions kept in our private files. There was more, but Babe was bored. She went on to the little black notebook. There was nothing in it, but... Penciled and highly abbreviated records of visits to libraries, quotations from books with titles like History of Angelina and Tyler Counties, and Kirk Family History. Babe threw that aside, too. Where could Uncle Alton be? She began to sing tunelessly, pretending to dance a minuet with flowing skirts like a girl she had seen in the movies. A rustle of the bushes at the entrance to the place stopped her. She peered upward, saw them being thrust aside. Quickly, she ran to a tiny cul-de-sac in the rock wall, just big enough for her to hide in. She giggled at the thought of how surprised Uncle Alton would be when she jumped out at him. She heard the newcomer come shifting down the steep slope of the crevice and land heavily on the floor. There was something about the sound. What was it? It occurred to her that though it was a hard job for a big man like Uncle Alton to get through the little opening in the bushes, she could hear no heavy breathing. Babe peered out into the main cave and squealed in utmost horror. <coughs> Standing there was not Uncle Alton, but a massive caricature of a man. A huge thing, like an irregular mud doll, clumsily made. It quivered and parts of it glistened and parts of it were dried and crumbling. Half of the lower left part of its face was gone, giving it a lopsided look. It had no perceptible mouth or nose, and its eyes were crooked, one higher than the other. Both a dingy brown, no whiteness at all. It stood quite still, looking at her, its only movement a steady, unalive quivering of its body. It wondered about the queer little noise Babe had made. 
concave cracked back against a little pocket of stone, her brain running round and round in tiny circles of agony. She opened her mouth to cry out and could not. Her eyes bulged and her face flamed with the strangling effort and the two golden ropes of her braided hair twitched and twitched as she hunted hopelessly for a way out. Babe lay opened-eyed and frozen, mounting pressure of terror, stilling her lungs, making her heart shake the whole world. The monster came to the mouth of the little pocket, tried to walk to her and was stopped by the side. It was such a narrow little fissure and it was all Babe could do to get in. The thing from the wood stood straining against the rock at its shoulders, pressing harder and harder to get to Babe. The substance of its feet spread slowly under the tremendous strain and at its shoulder appeared a slight crack. It widened at the monster, unfeelingly crushed itself against the rock and suddenly a large piece of the shoulder came away and the thing twisted slushily three feet farther in. It lay quietly with its muddy eyes fixed on her and then brought one thick arm up over its head and reached. Babe scrambled in the inch farther than that she'd believed possible and the filthy clubbed hand stroked down her back, leaving a trail of muck on the blue denim on the shirt she wore. The monster surged suddenly and lying full length now gained the last precious inch. A black hand seized one of her braids and for Babe... The lights went out. When she came to, she was dangling by her hair from that same crusted paw. The thing held her high so that her face and its features he- featureless head were not more than a foot apart. It gazed at her with a mild curiosity in its eyes, and it swung her slowly back and forth. The agony of her pulled hair did what fear could not do, gave her a voice. She screamed. She opened her mouth and puffed up her powerful young lungs, and she sounded off. She held her throat in the position of the first scream, and her chest labored and pumped more air through the frozen throat, shrill and monotonous and infinitely piercing her screams. The thing did not mind. It held her as she was and watched. When it had learned all it could from this phenomenon, it dropped her jarringly and looked around the half-cave, ignoring the stunned and huddled babe. Babe opened her eyes, saw that she was free, and just as the thing turned back to her, she drove between its legs and out into the shallow pool in the front of the rock, paddled across and hit the other bank screaming. A vicious little light of fury burned in her. She picked up a great fruit-sized stone and hurled it with all her frenzied might. It flew low and fast and struck squashedly on the monster's ankle. The thing was just taking a step toward the water. The stone caught it off balance, and its unpractised equilibrium could not save it. It tottered for a long, silent moment at the edge, and then splashed into the stream. Without a second look, Babe ran shrieking away. Corey Drew was following the little gobs of mold that somehow indicated the path of the murderer, and he was nearby when he first heard her scream. He broke into a run, dropping his shotgun and holding his 3240 ready to fire. He ran with such deadly panic in his heart that he ran right past the huge cleft rock and was a hundred yards past it before she burst out through the pool and ran up the bank. He had to run hard and fast to catch her because anything behind her was that faceless horror in the cave and she was living for the one idea of getting away from there. He caught her in his arms and swung her up to him and she screamed on and on and on. Babe didn't see Corey at all even when he held her and quieted her. The monster lay in the water. It neither liked nor disliked the new element. It rested on the bottom, its massive head a foot beneath the surface, and it curiously considered the facts that it had gathered. There was the little humming noise of Babe's voice that sent the monster questing into the cave. There was the black material of the briefcase that resisted so much more than green things when he tore it. There was the little two-legged one who sang and brought him near and who screamed when he came. There was this new, cold, moving thing he had fallen into. It was washing his body away. That had never happened before. That was interesting. The monster decided to stay and observe this new thing. It felt no urge to save itself. It could only be curious. 
The brook came laughing down out of its spring, ran down from its source, beckoning to the sunbeams and embracing freshlets and helpful brooklets. It shouted and played with streaming little roots and nudged the minnows and the pollywogs about in its tiny backwaters. It was a happy brook. When it came to the pool by the cloven rock, it found the monster there and plucked at it. It soaked the foul substances and smoothed and melted the molds, and the waters below the thing eddied darkly with its diluted matter. It was a thorough brook. It washed all it touched persistently. When it found filth, it removed filth, and if there were layer on layer of foulness, then layer by foul layer it was removed. It was a good brook. It did not mind the poison of the monster, but it took up and thinned it and spread it in little rings around rocks downstream, and then it drift to the rootlets of water plants that they might grow greener and lovelier. And the monster melted. I am smaller, the thing thought. That is interesting. I could not move now. And now this part of me which thinks is going too. It'll stop in just a moment and drift away with the rest of the body. It'll stop thinking and I will stop being. And that too is a very interesting thing. So the monster melted and dirtied the water and the water was clean again, washing and washing the skeleton that the monster had left. It was not very big, and there was a badly keeled knot on the left arm. The sunlight flickered on the triangular silver plate set in the pale skull, and the skeleton was now very clean. The brook laughed about it for an age. They found the skeleton, six grim-lipped men who came to find a killer. No one had believed Babe when she told her story days later. It had to be days later because Babe had screamed for seven hours without stopping and had lain like a dead child for a day. No one believed her at all because her story was all about the bad fella and they knew that the bad fella was simply a thing that her father had made up to frighten her with. But it was through her that the skeleton was found and so the men at the bank sent a check to the Drews for more money than they had ever dreamed about. It was old Roger Kirk, sure enough, that skeleton, though it was found five miles from where he had died and sank into the forest floor where the hot molds built around his skeleton and emerged a monster. So the Drews had a new barn and fine new livestock, and they hired four men. But they didn't have Alton, and they didn't have Kimbo. And babe... It's all just a bad dream, honey. ...screams at night. Mommy! There's nobody else here. ...and has grown very thin. You've been listening to... It, a short story by Theodore Sturgeon. This is Fortunato for Gremlin Time. We'd like to thank our 3D radio players. We had Orange Julius, Woody Creek, Felicity White, and in the role of Babe, Shrieking Violet. Music for tonight's program was composed for the TV shows Twin Peaks and The X-Files. We also had... Some music by the great movie soundtrack composer Bernard Harriman that was composed for the Brian De Palma film, Sisters. This is Fortunato. Thank you for joining us this evening on the Bedtime Radio Show for Grown Ups, Gremlin Time.